Hi, thanks for joining me today. As always, I'm Abby. This is Stories Lived, Stories Told, and here's what I know. We have so much to learn when we start looking at and really paying attention to our stories. They can help reveal to us some old patterns and themes that might be big in our lives, and also they can help us to decide what new stories we want to be telling for ourselves and for others in the future so that we can start to be really intentional about creating better social worlds. I'm excited that we are going to be diving into some stories today and get to do some of that reflecting back and also that looking forward. Today we are finishing our conversation with Dr. Paul Porter. If you haven't listened to the first part of our conversation, then I'll suggest you take the time to go do that first so you have a better idea of who Paul is and also a little more context for this part of the conversation. Today, we're really diving into Paul's work as the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for the National Speech and Debate Association. Some questions that I would have you keep in mind as you join us in this conversation are, what do diversity, equity, and inclusion mean to you? And what kind of platform or privilege do you have when it comes to telling your story? What kind of disadvantages do you have? And then, how could you be making space for other people to tell their stories? So where we last left off with Paul, we were talking about his experience in high school of doing morning announcements, radio, and of joining the speech team. So we'll jump right back in there. In my mind, talk about meaning. For me, competition means preparation. Mm Mm-hmm all year year round conditioning in the weight room and mm-hmm. the you know the running and the jumping and the you know conditioning your bodies taking care of your bodies meetings and conversations and things like that even reading materials that our coaches would give us to get us thinking about how we take care of our bodies how we take mm-hmm. care of our minds how we are good citizens and how all of that gets wrapped up in sport and so for me if i'm going to do something competitively it's just like football it's preparation it's practice it's consistent thinking about what it means to be part of this activity And so I wanted to jump into that as soon as the season was over. It was a sectional tournament, by the way. So I knew that I couldn't join the team Mm -hmm. my my junior year when I found out about it. But I knew that I could, in my mind, I thought, well, I can start preparing for next year's summer. I'm going to prep. I'm going to practice. I'm going to learn. I'm going to be great when the season starts. And when I found out that radio was an event, I thought I'm going to be the greatest thing in the history of speech and debate. Yeah. And the funny thing, Abby, is that the path that I thought I was carving for myself when I was 17, I honestly think is actually, I think I have actually ended up where I thought I was going to end up. So when Mm. I was this like big talker thinking that I was going to rule the world, I think I got exactly where I wanted to go. And I think that's why I stuck around. I started doing speech and debate my senior year of high school. That year was magical. I was a, a state finalist. I was a two-time national high school finalist. I went on to, to college to be on the be on the speech team at at Ball State University. Those are the four greatest years of of my life. For all the trials, all the tribulations, all the laughs, yep. all the tears, all the good, all the bad, all the lessons learned, the easy way and the hard way. I wouldn't give up my time at Ball State University or my time on the Ball State speech team, I wouldn't give it up for anything in the world. I am not the human being that I am today if I hadn't gone to Ball State and hadn't been coached by some outstanding human beings that not only cared about me, but knew how to go upside my head and metaphorically grab me by the scruff of the neck. I had people that gave me tough love. I had people that gave me kindness. I learned what inclusion meant Mm -hmm. because of speech and debate. I'm thinking of a line that I said, I did a, a, a keynote at a prestigious debate tournament back in December, the the Blake School in Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, hosts a debate tournament, very prestigious debate tournament every December. And they host a, a DEI conference, the back end of the tournament. Mm-hmm. And I was asked to be the keynote this past year. And I, I think back to something that I said during that keynote, I said that I love speech and debate. And it is one of the first things that ever unconditionally loved me back. Mm. Doing speech and debate introduced me to calm studies. As you can probably guess from piecing together 
my my little mini life story. I went to Ball State because their mass media program back then, telecommunications, is a highly regarded and still a highly regarded major. I was going to go and I was going to graduate and I was going to be on the Today Show five days after graduation and I should be a billionaire by now. And I don't know why that hasn't happened. Yes, I do. Uh, because I it really wasn't where I was meant to be. I was more concerned about being on the speech team. That was my focus. That's what made me happy. Being on mm -hmm. the speech team, doing speech and debate made me happy. And being in the old AC building, the Arts and Communications building, running those hallways, I met a lot of the comm studies faculty. And I got really interested in in who they are and, and what they did and what they taught. And I kind of felt left out that I didn't have these relationships with with them, people like Beth Mesner or Marcy Meyer. Yeah. The Laura O'Hara. I, I didn't have those types of relationships with with them, Glenn Stamp and and, and others. But I wanted those. Yeah. I really did because they were such you could just tell that they were good and caring people. Mm -hmm. They are good and caring people, by the way. They are. Still. And I got to experience them. And it's the same for me that I actually started as political science when I went to Ball State. I didn't know that. Well, it was short lived, very like less than a semester because my immediate thought was these people are the worst. There's a lot of nuances that made me say that probably some of that lack of curiosity and question asking and open mindedness. And then yeah. I found myself in the con department. I said, well, the reason I stay is because these people are the best. And there's a lot of, you know, yeah, layers to what I mean when I say that. But they really are some of like the greatest people. And I feel very similar of like, it is not an overstatement when I say like, I owe so much of like who I am and how I am to speech. You know, when I said that I love speech and debate, and it is one of the first things that ever loved me back. I love that comm department. And they loved me back mm -hmm. and they had every reason in the world not to. Mm. They took a chance on me when I gave them every reason not to. I think it would be safe to say I was a, I was a handful to deal with. Mm. And, you know, a lot of that, and I didn't know it then, I know it now, was tied to mental illness. I did not realize some of the mental health struggles that that I had when I was younger that I realized them now. I got... I went to my first therapy session. I saw a psychiatrist for the first time. I think I, that I remember I saw a psychiatrist when I was 35. And that's when I learned about ADHD, like learned what it really mm -hmm. is. That's when I learned about what depression was. That's when I learned about what anxiety was. I didn't know what those things were. I remember when I got diagnosed with those things, I looked a psychiatrist dead in the face and I said, really, I thought I was just a jackass. Mm. And that's what I would project out to people talk about making you know our organization and construction of meaning i could just yeah. explain it all away by being this character that was you know just a goof off and really what i was doing was i was hiding i thought i was hiding who i was and trying mm -hmm. to project what people wanted and the faculty in the comm department at ball state saw right through it but the interesting thing is that very few of them called it out. They just accepted me for who I was trying to be. Mm. Well, I think also longing to see who I actually was and who I could be. I think part of the reason I am so proud to give back to Ball State is because I get to show them who I was all this time. Mm-hmm. And just didn't know it. Really didn't. I stayed in the discipline because of the people. I went to graduate school, went to Eastern Michigan. I learned how to be a speech team coach. I learned a little bit about how to be an administrator. I was taught by some great scholars and by some great administrators. I knew that I wanted to go into administration at some point, but I also knew that I wanted to be a professor. And I knew that for a long time. While I was at Ball State, something in my heart said, and I remember the first time that Karma Schwager, don't know where she is, wherever she is, I hope she's doing okay. She was my academic advisor. And she sat with me and she said, have you ever thought about being a professor? Because what she knew for me was that I really, 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 really wanted to coach speech team. And she said, well, why don't you become a professor? Have you ever thought about being a professor? And in my mind, I thought, I'm just a big goof off. I can't be a professor. And I remember she looked at me and she said, no one's buying your act, Paul. Whoa. 
And that's, I think, when it really started to hit me that, you know, I grew up in a, in a, in a neighborhood that, that isn't the greatest neighborhood. I mean, it's home and I love it, but it's, it's not in the best economic shape. There aren't $2 million houses in my neighborhood. And so living in, in that neighborhood, college was a pipe dream for many of us, Mm. let alone getting paid by one to be a professor that for me was groundbreaking to go and actually to do that to teach college courses to be called professor i remember my mom still to this day my mom calls me dr porter she is so (laughs) proud of of that i don't think she understands what any of it means but well we'd have to ask her what meaning did she make of it (laughs) you know what i will i will i only left com studies because i left faculty life and I went on to to pursue administration. And my, my PhD is actually in educational leadership from Indiana State with a focus on higher education. And so I studied how colleges work. And I found myself in many instances drawing upon my ORCOM knowledge, my rhetoric background, because I really focused on public address and rhetoric. In, in graduate school with a little intercultural communication doodling around the edges. I got to use some of my sociology background, which if you think about it, those sociology and interpersonal are so part and parcel. I was able to use the things that I learned and then found this really cool intersection because it was really during my PhD program that I got to really sink my teeth into DEI and multiculturalism the way that I wanted to. I'll say that my experience with speech seems very similar to yours. My only divergence is now at this point where I've kind of left this world of speech. It's something that sticks with me. Mm -hmm. But you've been in the world of speech for 25 years now. I'd say on and off for 26. Mm. But I'd also say that, you know, I left for a while too. Yeah. I've never been a head speech coach. Mm -hmm. Never been a head coach. I've had opportunities never happened and you know when i when i started to really get into my my career i realized that the direction that i saw myself going in probably was not going to include speech and debate mm. and so i i got away a little bit and certainly when i realized that i wanted to study how colleges work and i wanted to study experiences of students particularly students of color on a college campus i i I threw myself into that study. I stopped going to the National Communication Association conference, and I started going mm. to conferences on student affairs and on you know, student enrollment and student engagement and stuff like that. And so I, I, I left for, for a while, and I worked at a small university in Indianapolis for a little bit, Marion University. And I remember when they built a, a speech team and they started a speech team, and I thought, oh, I'm going to come back. And then even then it didn't happen. And I really grew comfortable with being the guy that had a speech and debate background, but wasn't affiliated with the speech team. Mm. And I didn't think I'd ever come back. I really didn't. I got my PhD. I moved out to Pennsylvania. I worked at the University of Scranton, ran a multicultural center and left only because there was an opportunity in Indianapolis to work at the IU Med School and uh, serve as their director of diversity programming and assessment. And that's when I got so caught up in my career that I needed something in addition to my work. I remember seeing a therapist and my therapist said, you need a hobby. Like, you need something to do. And I remember her asking me a question like, what do you like to do when you're not working? And I thought, it's usually when I go to the bathroom and sleep. <laughs> That's what I do. I go to the bathroom and I sleep. That's mm-hmm. what I do when I'm not working. And mm-hmm. I just remember her asking me, you know, are there things in your life that you enjoy? Like, what do you like? What do you like to do? What are your mm-hmm. hobbies? And since she told me I needed a hobby. And ironically enough, it's it's interesting the way the stars align sometimes. I got a call from a speech coach at my alma mater that said, hey, we've got these two kids that are going to nationals, and would you come watch them do a performance? And I watched them, and I gave them some feedback, and it was cool for what it was. It was just me popping in to, to, to watch a couple kids from my high school. And when they got back from the national tournament, uh, that coach called me and said, why don't you want to get in on this? You want to like coach a little bit? And it's funny. I still remind him of this. He said, you know, you could you know, come in and coach a couple days a week, go to a tournament a month. And I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. 
I should have known. Oh, I should have <laughs> known. And I just fell back in love with it. Yep. And so that's the thing that I would tell anybody that maybe leaves leaves an activity, leaves a first love. You can always come back to it. Mm. And I threw myself back into it. Really, really enjoyed it. I got a chance to to coach events that I hadn't thought about in years. That's how I found my way back and and mm-hmm. through it. And then, you know, as I started to find pathways and opportunities to let my DEI work interplay with my speech and debate work. That's where I found opportunities to lend voice to our state's leadership uh, in terms of the association, the Indiana School Speech and Debate Association, how to give people my own perspective and insight on DE&I and how we can use speech and debate as an avenue for you know engaging young students of color, creating opportunities and pathways to retention and graduation. Mm-hmm building skills to go to college and be successful in college, develop careers, things like that. Now it's just th- those two things are so deeply intertwined with with me and yeah. and and who I am and what I love and, and what I value that I, I it's hard to think of one with without the other. Especially over the past couple of years, I think a lot of people would recognize DEI, you know, talking about diversity, equity, inclusion, but maybe don't have a more in-depth understanding of it. Can you explain what it means to you at least so one thing i like to do and i and i appreciate this question and anybody that knows me would hear that question and think yeah that's paul's question (laughs) when it comes to dei i'm a big fan of definitions and i'm a big fan of definitions because we need them in order to give structure Mm -hmm. and and frame of reference to what those words mean we all know how to use those buzzwords right we all know how to as my mother would say talk the bs and we know how to say them and sometimes not know what they mean. Right. And so for me, the definitions are really important. I define diversity as the presence of different individual and intersecting identities. I think of equity as a commitment, a shared commitment to conditions of fairness in the processes and procedures of an organization. I like to think of inclusion as a commitment to involving and uplifting diverse perspectives. So it is the, uh, I think of inclusion as the sharing of space with all. I, 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 I have to use those definitions so that when I talk about DE&I, the people have an understanding of exactly what it is that I mean. I'm not just right. talking about equity so that I can sound like I'm in the know, but rather... Right. It's important to me that people know that I'm talking about the idea of shared conditions for organizational fairness. Those are helpful definitions, I think, Mm -hmm. because they are have come to be buzzwords in a lot of ways. And I think there are a lot of concepts or words that are really helpful, again, when you can look at the complexity of them and look at the layers of them, but have kind of been reduced down to just buzzwords. know something I'm curious about what you have to say on the idea of how do we promote or I don't know what verb you would use but how do we reflect that we have those values out into the world on a personal level and on an organizational level because you're doing that for your job now being the DEI director for the NSTA but how do we do that on like a personal level too I think very similarly I'm going to add one more word and that word is multicultural Mm mm-hmm And that word has done a lot for my conceptual framework when it comes to the DEI work that I get to do. I think that speech and debate is a multicultural activity. And when I say that, I mean that it is an activity that invites and holds space for so many different identities. A lot of people hear the word diversity and they just think of race or what I call the big three, race, gender, and sexuality. Yep. But it's much more than that. 
it is its race and its gender and its sexual orientation, but it's faith tradition, it's body type, it is different abilities, it's nationality, it's political preference, it's geographic location. Because, you know, the experience that that you might have had in a suburban setting different than what I had in an urban setting. It's uh-huh. it's education level, it's it's economic status, it's all of these different things because they all beget different realities and to parse them down to just a couple, I think it's just, it's unfair. Yeah. It stifles the whole 40 million conversation that we had earlier. Yeah. I almost want to think about it like when I hear the word diversity or when I use the word diversity, I want to put like diversity parentheses of experience. And that would be when you have two people in a room, you have a diversity of experience. They might have some similarities, yes. you know, but it's like the more people you can get to the table the more diversity of experience you'll have, which can encompass all of those, like you were saying, all those identities that some people might have shared experiences within. Absolutely. If we can say diversity and think diversity of experience, then that, to me, for me at least, adds some of those layers back in that I feel like have been taken away by the overuse of the word. I also think that people will say that diversity is divisive. And I will ask, why? And they'll say, well, you know, when you're talking about diversity, you are actually leaving some people out because when we talk about diversity, and sometimes I'll stop them and say, hold on, let me make this easy for you. When we're talking about diversity, we mean black people. Yes. I mean, no, but, but, but kind of, and I'm like, yeah, if you want to think of it as, as that restrictive, Mm -hmm. but if you want to think about it from a multicultural perspective, right? what we've just said is that everyone is going to get invited to this table because Just because you're white doesn't mean that you can't have mental illness or just because you are a male doesn't mean that you have to be heterosexual. And so if you think about it, we all bring something to the DEI conversation. We all bring something to this big, massive salad bowl that is the world to beget diversity. Mm -hmm. Would some say that that's an aspirational line of thought? Absolutely. I just think it's the reality of the world that while you may only have one thing to offer, you have something to offer. And I think that it is, I think it's just wrong to to leave that, to leave people out. So Mm -hmm. it's almost like eating a salad. If you want to, if you go to a salad bar, and I used to do this when I was a kid, Traditionally, when we think of a salad bar, you start with lettuce, and lettuce is usually the majority of a salad. If you just eat a bowl of salad, that's boring. But if you just have a bowl of toppings, that can be overwhelming, Hmm. and you are missing something, and what you're missing is the majority. And so I think that having all of those things come together, but then positioning all of those things to work in concert to create this richness that is the benefit of diversity. That to me is a wonderful thing. Yeah. I'll go ahead and be explicit and say that white people are the lettuce. And I think specifically white men in the United States is what I'm thinking of is that the reason that I think it probably what you hear mostly is people who are white, being the people who feel maybe threatened or uncertain about DEI Mm -hmm. work is because we've taken for granted that there will be space for our voices to be heard. Yeah. And so it takes empathy. It takes imagination, Mm -hmm. curiosity to put yourself in the position of what if that wasn't the case? What if that wasn't a given And I think to just because I'm loving our metaphor, you're going to go down the salad metaphor a little further is that people like different things on their salad. Everyone has lettuce. Right. Everyone has lettuce. Right. But what else gets to be a part of the, you know, salad of society or whatever, you know, it's like, it's not a pie. It's not percentages of a whole. Right. Where you being able to tell your story takes away from me being able to tell my story. Mm -hmm. It is endless supply. It's this, you know, I've heard people talk about a scarcity Mm -hmm. mindset and we think about that with like real tangible resources, but also I think kind of socially the space that we have, I have to hoard it up for myself so that I can protect my story from being told. But really if I 
not even step back, but just step to the side mm -hmm. so that someone else can also step up and share their story. Mm -hmm. Again, it's richer. It's <laughs> more flavorful if I'm still talking about the salad, I guess. But like it's the taking for granted the people who have had the power, who have been the default to feel threatened. Mm -hmm. But it's the difference. And I think like Brene Brown is someone who I know who's like used this language, but it's the difference between like power over versus like power with maybe is right. Language. Is, right. I'm not a great expert on that, but it's like there is room. And that's a huge part of the CMM theory, too, of like when you look at stories mm -hmm. and you look at the stories that are love, the stories that are told, right? Name right. of the podcast. Mm -hmm. But then in between all these other stories, the ones that yeah. aren't told, the ones that aren't heard, the ones that we can't tell, the ones that, you know, all the list is really endless of all right. these stories in between. Right. So we have to look at why haven't those stories been heard? Why hasn't that person felt like they could tell their story? I feel like that's what DEI work is about. I think also I'm going to throw in another metaphor that I use, and that's the the tried and true place at the table. And I've had people say before, well, Paul, if, if I have eight chairs at the table and there were seven white people at the table, but you want to bring in four people of color, what do I do? Do I like, do people sit on their, do people sit on each other's laps or you know, what do I do? And does someone sit on the floor? I mean, like, what do you do when you've only got eight chairs and there's one open, but you want to bring four people in? What do you do? And my response is get a bigger table. That's what I was going to say. Build a bigger table. And it's sad that we have to tackle this. Diversity isn't about silence. Mm-hmm. It's actually about us all getting louder. Together, yeah. You are adding more sound. And if there's a majority, think of that as the foundational sound. Mm -hmm. Like that's the sound that's always been there. My story shouldn't silence your story. Yeah. My story with your story creates a conversation. One of my inspirations is a guy named Lee Moon Wah. There are two things that he oftentimes says in, in his trainings that have always stuck with me. One is a quote from Mother Teresa when she says that perhaps the reason we have no peace is because we have forgotten that we belong to each other. The second one, and this is straight from Lee Moon Wah, he would say that we are only but one conversation from the relationship that changes the rest of our lives. Mm. That conversation can take place when my story comes into contact with your story. And as long as we remember that I'm sharing my story, well, she's sharing her story. Okay, so let, let's listen to each other's stories. Let the learning and the awareness and the conversation happen. Heaven forbid we bring a third person into that conversation. The conversation gets bigger. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily, well, you have to be quiet, white people, so that the black folk can talk as much as it is less whole space for everybody because I'm going to get yeah. my turn too. And you're mm -hmm. right. We have this scarcity mindset. We compete against each other. We have this thing called the oppression Olympics, which is where we have this competition for who is being the most disadvantaged. And at the end of the day, we're all disadvantaging ourselves because we are not taking time to hear each other, care about each other and yeah. recognize that we've all got our nonsense. Uh -huh. And if we can hear each other, we can help each other. I think the point about the table points to it being an issue with the system. Yeah. And it even goes back to this questioning that we talked mm -hmm. about really early on that's really necessary because yeah. we've got the hand-me-downs of systems that mm -hmm. were created hundreds of years ago. That weren't created for some of us. Right. They were not created for everyone. And like you said, you know, what your generation didn't get was that questioning. And right. so some of these systems have gone unquestioned right. for centuries. Right. And it's very uncomfortable and it's very hard and it's a very complex thing, but it is mm -hmm. worth doing the questioning, the looking into to say, does this actually work for us anymore? Yeah, I want to say, just build a bigger table. And it's one of those things where it's like what it looks like to actually, quote unquote, build a bigger table. You are so right. Is so big and scary. Yeah. But in my mind, necessary because you have to be honest and say, though, this isn't working. This table isn't working for us anymore. It's falling mm -hmm. apart. If you've ever studied social change disruption, it is just how it sounds. It is the idea of disrupting the status quo for the greater good. And I think that 
while it's easy to talk about movements and protests, we saw the summer of 2020 mm -hmm. is the perfect example of individuals disrupting the status quo. And I don't think that what anyone realized was that that entire time, those that were demonstrating and protesting and marching and singing and yelling and screaming, what they were trying to do was to get those who are controlling those systems, who have mm -hmm. benefited from those systems, who have inherited those systems without necessarily earning the privileges that come with those systems, to disrupt themselves. Mm -hmm. And to step back and say, how are we going to dismantle the system that benefits me? That is, I think, the, the hardest part about the sustaining of those systems and the questioning that some of us have had to learn how to do because we may struggle with the idea that we are going to disrupt that which continues to give us systemic wealth, economic wealth, sociological power and status, things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Using this language from coordinated management, a meaning of a better social world being the goal, mm -hmm. always the goal. We're always working yeah. towards a better social world through the lens of DEI. What is a better social world? And what do we need to do to get there? I think a better social world is a world in which everybody can exist, live their authentic lives, and not have to justify it. I think a better social world is a world in which we see things that we don't understand, and we are just caught in curiosity and wonder. And we can go to someone and say, I've never smelled food like that. What is that? Oh, that's cool. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Now, I've never, I've always thought those foods to be gross, but like, what is it that you like about them? Oh, okay, cool, cool. We know, enjoy your meal. That's awesome. It's really, really interesting. It's such a unique smell. Or to see somebody type something on social media and think, huh, would have never saw that perspective, but all right, cool. Can appreciate that. I think the first step is that we have to stop being afraid of each other. I have a therapist right now that often tells me that this process is going to be a lot harder before it gets a lot easier. And you're going to mm -hmm. feel a lot worse before you feel better. Yeah. And I think that the first thing we have to do in order to get to the future is we have to sit in the past. I'm a big believer in history because there are, it's stories lived and stories told. And we're silencing stories right yeah. now. We have to listen to people's stories. We have to listen to our community's stories. We have to sit in the guilt of those stories. We have to sit in the pain of those stories. We have to recognize that we weren't there and that there has been social corruption. There has been political corruption. There has been racism and sexism and homophobia and xenophobia and Islamophobia, white privilege, male privilege, Christian privilege, economic privilege, educated privilege, body privilege. I could go on and on mm -hmm. and on. We have to sit in the reality that these things have existed, that they have benefited some, that they have disadvantaged others. We have to come to the conclusion that it's not a coincidence that there are these economic gaps, that there are housing disparities, that there are educational disparities, that there is pay inequity. And then, you know, we could start by saying, I'm sorry. We could start by not just sitting and watching people's pain, but have a little empathy and have a little sympathy and look someone in the face and, and care about them enough to not want to see people feel that way again. And maybe then we can all sit down at one big giant table with a big giant bowl of salad and ask ourselves, how are we going to fix this? Mm -hmm. What are we going to do? And sometimes that's going to mean, you know, the laundry lists of different ways in which those disadvantages and those disparities are still in existence and that one by one we got to tear them down 
And maybe we have to ask ourselves the question, are we cool enough with the reality that if we care about each other, we can all win? It is certainly possible. Uh Uh-huh. Again, altruistic, aspirational. Is it realistic? I don't know if we will be here to ever know. One of my favorite poems was written in honor of the great Oscar Romero, now Saint Oscar Romero. He was the Archbishop of San Salvador in the 1970s, 1980s. I visited El Salvador a few years ago, and it is a place in the world that will always be close to my heart. The last lines of the poem are, we are workers, we are not master builders, we are ministers, not messiahs. We are prophets of a future, not our own. It is the poet's way of saying that we are doing work or an end result that we won't be here for. Yeah. And we have to ask ourselves, is it worth it? Think about all the people in history that we've learned about, Martin Luther King, Cesar Chavez, Dorothy Day. They're not here. Was their struggle worth it? Black man talking to a white woman uh, on a a podcast where we're sharing our stories and listening to each other. Mm -hmm. I'd like to think that Dr. King or Malcolm X or Stokely Carmichael would watch this and say, okay, maybe we're getting somewhere. Now, some of them might say, no, we're getting somewhere if this is on the up and up and she doesn't harm his words. And now, you know, Barbara Jordan might roll through and say, she's going to have a black woman on her next. I've been thinking a lot about imagination lately Mm -hmm. in terms of, I used the word empathy earlier of like, you have to have imagination to have empathy. You have to use your imagination. And that's something that I think adults at least don't think about themselves as living in their imagination. It feels like maybe a childish thing or not like a really functional thing, but everything came from somebody's imagination. Absolutely. And so I think it's okay for us to be in this imaginative space right now. Yeah. Which is what I am asking when I say, what does a better social world look like and how mm-hmm. do we get there? We don't know the answers. It's not happening today. It's not happening tomorrow. It's not happening in the next 10 years, 50 years, who knows, you know, but it is happening in our imagination. And that's what starts it down the path to becoming a reality. Mm-hmm. All of these people you listed, there are things that if they're on a podcast, right. they'd be saying this is the kind of world I imagine, but that's probably not a reality. Dr. King said it the night before he died. Yeah, but there are things that they would have said weren't a reality that are a reality now or, you know, or are at least a step closer to being more of a reality. Again, it is, yeah, the better social world that leaning into that complexity, leaning into the idea that there's something bigger than yourself, you're a part of something bigger than yourself, this world, this social world that we're in. And yeah, like letting, I don't know, I'm struck by all of these kind of seemingly small moments that you pointed out in your story that have stuck with you. And I feel like that's a good micro example of something that also happens on a bigger scale Mm -hmm. is that those moments have stuck with you and it shaped you and you can point to specifically and say this kind of seemingly insignificant thing. I got placed here for homeroom. I had this professor, this person said these couple words to me. Yeah. That you can very clearly connect the dots and say, and that is why I am where I am today. Yeah. I think that happens on a societal level, too, of the little things being the things that we can point back to sometimes, too, and say, well, that was a game changer, even though in the moment it felt small. Absolutely. You say imagination. I say dreams. And if you're willing to, if you're willing to invest in your dreams, they become this thing called hope, I think, for a better social world. We have to have some hope. You know, I made reference to 2020. I think we lost hope because no one should have to die for us to do something about the world. Mm -hmm. This is the biggest regret that I have of the summer of 2020 was that all those statues that came crumbling down, all those sports teams that changed their names, all these companies writing these statements, crafting these strategic plans, and you know what now seems a little more normal, which is every time you turn around, you see more racial diversity, representational diversity mm-hmm. in groups. Why does somebody have to die? Why did someone have to lose their life? For us to say that the idea of a biracial woman being vice president of the United States That could work. That's an idea. What I would tell every young person listening, listening to to this podcast, I would say, 
get ready because I'm going to tag you in at some point. Because mm-hmm. at some point I'm going to slow down. And, you know, at some point you all have to step in. I hope that I have made a little progress so that the work isn't as hard. Well, I certainly think so. And I think that's a great call to action waiting in the wings, uh, you know, kind of like a get ready yeah, and get working now. But I, I think that's a great thing to end on. And I really appreciate everything that you have said today. And it's given me so much that's going to stick with me, I think, and things I want to keep thinking about and keep asking questions about and keep learning about for sure. Thanks for your time today, Paul. Anytime. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. I'm glad to do it. Well, that is all for our conversation with Paul Porter. I'm so glad you were able to be a part of this conversation with us. I hope you can take some time to keep reflecting on the two parts of this conversation and what they meant to you. Hope you found meaning and value in it. If so, please let me know what it meant to you. Reach out on Instagram, YouTube, or on the website, and you can be in contact with me. I love to talk about questions or ideas that you have. As always, I get to do this podcast with support from the CMM Institute for Personal and Social Evolution. They are the greatest people I have gotten to work with individually and together. They're on the path to creating a better social world, and I'm so honored to be a part of it. You can read more about them on my website or theirs, and I'll include both of those links below. And last but not least, I have some next turns for you that will really help this Stories Lived, Stories Told community to keep growing. So please follow the show wherever you listen. Leave a review and a rating if you can. Share an episode with someone. And lastly, like I said, connect with me on Instagram, YouTube, or on the Stories Live, Stories Told website. Thank you so much for taking the time to do one or all of those things. And thank you for showing up. Thank you for being curious, and thank you for being a part of this story. Until next time, I'm Abby, and this has been Stories Lived, Stories Told. 